Alrighty, welcome back. This is going to be day number four for the Civil War and Reconstruction second lecture. And we're going to be finishing up this chapter. Um, tomorrow we're going to do a history lab. And next week we're going to do another assignment kind of review and then get, the te get into the test. I believe what I have it written down for Thursday. Alright. So... As we just got finished talking about with it's the end of the Civil War, we're starting getting into the 13th and 14th Amendment. The country is trying to reunify. They're working through issues. Uh, president Lincoln is assassinated and Johnson becomes president. Now, Johnson and Congress are butting heads. And it's going to actually show up that um, they're not going to get along. All right. So let's get right into this. So starting off, Congress attempts to remove Johnson. So the radical and moderate Republicans turned on Johnson and wanted him out of office. However, there's only one way to remove a president, and that is impeachment. Well, to get impeached, the president has to do something which violates the law. Well, what happens is he actually fires his secretary of war. So he ends up firing his Secretary of War against what Congress passed a law known as the Tenure of Office Act. This act actually limited the president's power to dismiss his own cabinet members. So when he goes off and fires his Secretary of War, he is in violation of constitutional uh, law. Well, this also goes against his argument with the radical Republicans. So it's not just this one incident. This has been built up for a while. So he's accused of being drunk, unpopular. He speaks out to get con Congress. But the one act that they really get to go after him for is that he fires his secretary of war. Well, it's coming through. Excuse me real quick. <clears throat> so when you look up impeachment. What does it mean? Impeachment is a process in which an official is accused of unlawful activity, which may include the removal of that official from office as well as crime, uh, other crimes and punishments. All right, so we actually have uh, impeached presidents. Uh, Bill Clinton was an impeached president, um, but his crime was not severe enough to remove him being warranted for office. Uh, President Nixon wasn't uh, was going to be impeached, but he resigned before they could officially file. All right. So, like I stated, Congress just really wanted to fire Johnson, and we're looking for any excuse to do so. So they ended up getting that when he fired the Secretary of War. The only way a president can fully be impeached and is fired is if the Senate also agrees with the impeachment. So now you have the House of Representatives and the Senate. Well, it comes down, and he is saved by one vote. All right, Johnson stays president because Edmund Ross actually votes not guilty, and that's the last one that is needed. That's the last vote needed, either one way or the other. He will not be bullied. Everybody tried to get him to do what they thought was right. He did what he thought was right. So after all this, he was impeached, but he was not removed from office. So Johnson was only in there for a short period of time. So now we have a new president coming in in 1868. War hero Ulysses S. Grant wins the presidency he is favored by all of the north almost all of the north and all the new african americans that are now free to vote okay so that plays a big part uh, like the, the previous slide said there was over pretty much half a million african americans that got him elected So we've got the Reconstruction is actually still going on. Uh, by 1870, all former Confederates were back in the Union. But the South is ruined economically, all right? Small farmers were ruined and property was no longer valuable. Hundreds and thousands of men died, leaving families without financial stability. 
All right. So all those men that went off to war, if they you know, if they died in battle, there was nobody to take care of the farm. All right. So with all of this, uh, the economically poor South, two things kind of happened. So first one. You had the Scallywags. These were white Southerners who joined the Republicans. They were small farmers who did not want the plantation, excuse me, plantation owners to have power. All right, these Scallywags were Southerners who they supported. They wanted Reconstruction. They wanted things to actually end up getting better versus returning to the old ways of before and during the Civil War. The second term that came up was the carpetbaggers. All right, these were northerners that traveled to the south to take advantage of the crashed economy. All right, they're called carpetbaggers because they pretty much carried everything that they owned in a little carpet bag, and they took advantage of whatever they could to become successful. So you could actually show up with nothing if you knew what you were doing, and then take advantage of the crashed economy in the South and actually become very prosperous. So this is an un unappeal this is unappealing depiction of a carpetbagger. All right. So I'll give you a few minutes to look over these things. And as you see here, it says they actually helped many black freemen and Southern supporters of reconstruction. All right. So, to improve former slaves' lives, you had a huge increase in African American churches. All right. Why do you think that African American churches actually grew in popularity or more per not predominant roles? Because what it does, it says, due to the oppressive practice, like 95% of former slaves could not read. So how else is information going to get passed? They, there's no newspapers that are going to be running around and being handed out. So this was a place to get information passed throughout a community. All right, And the South Reconstruction funded new public schools to increase literacy among the former slaves. All right. So since we talked about yesterday... When the uh, slaves were freed, you had, they didn't have anything. So without them having anything, they had to find a way to make a living. So they had to, uh, they had to you know, participate in something that was called sharecropping. What actually is sharecropping? Sharecropping is arrangements with former slaves who had no resources on the, of their own. The landowner would provide a cabin, a mule, tools, and a plot of land to the sharecropper. The sharecropper, in turn, gave a large share of his crop to the landowner. Well, most freemen became sharecroppers, others became tenant farmers. They rented land from the landowner, but provided their own tools and provisions. Very few freemen ever became landowners themselves. All right. If a sharecropper or a tenant farmer owned any money owed any monies at all to the land the landlord for cash loans or use of the tools, he or she could not leave until the debt was paid. In effect, tying the freedman down in a system of debt peonage. All right. So that just sounds a, a, another way to have somebody else work your land and be a slave. All right. So one of the most important aspects of Reconstruction was the active participation of African Americans in state and local governments across the South. Over 600 served as state legislators. African Americans filled numerous posts in state governments, including Governor of Louisiana. In South Carolina, African Americans became a majority of the state legislature and chose an African American Speaker of the House. Hiram Rhodes Revels, a Protestant minister, became the first African American to, to sit in Congress when he was elected as senator from Mississippi in 1870. Fifteen other African Americans sat in Congress during Reconstruction. Among the greatest 
areas of accomplishments of Reconstruction government were the creation of a system of public schools laws banning racial discrimination and the encouragement of investments in railroads. Reconstruction leaders generally favored modernization in the South. Nonetheless, Reconstruction governments faced great financial difficulties, were often guilty of the corruption that was widespread in the area in the era, excuse me, and never won the support of the majority of white Southerners. White Southerners especially resented Northern interference and did not recognize their former slaves as social equals. Without changing white Southern attitudes or giving African American greater resources, Reconstruction policies were ultimately doomed to fail once the North withdrawals. As all this is going on, is Reconstruction is trying to get worked. A racist terrorist group, a racist terrorist hate group known as the Ku Klux Klan arose in this era. All right, their goal was to advance their racist agenda and end Reconstruction. All right, 20,000 men, women, and children died from the ruthless terrorism of the Klan. All right. Their name comes from the Greek word kukos, which means circles. So their, me their name means knights of the circle. All right. So Congress is now starting to see this and goes and passes the Enforcement Acts of 1870 and 1871 to try and halt the evil actions of the Klan. All right. Through this act, federal troops could be sent against the Klan. All right, despite these efforts, the hate group gained a massive following in the South. Why do you think that even with federal intervention and congressional intervention, did this group actually grow in support in the South? All right, here you'll see a depiction as the later manifestations in the, the 20th century of the Klan. All right. I want to give you a quick warning real quick. This is next is a graphic image. Um, you can go ahead and skip together. I will not stay on this image more than 30 seconds if you need to. But in the late 19th and 20th centuries, many African Americans became victims of mob lynching. And it's important to take a look at this. But if you are easily disturbed, please skip ahead. Do not watch these images. Viewer discretion is warned. All right. But you need to take a look. And this is the part where I talked about that history is ugly and evil. We need to make sure that we take actions where stuff like this never happens again. All right. So the support for Reconstruction fades. Okay. There's a, a bank failure in 1873 and a bad economy t takes the focus off of Reconstruction. So everybody's focus before this is how can we make sure that you know, the new freed blacks, former slaves, are, uh, you know, brought up. Let's, let's see what we can do to help them. Well, as soon as they hit economic hard times, everybody's focus changes from Reconstruction to back to fixing the economy. All right, so 1876, new election comes out, and it's going to be Samuel Tin Tilden, who is a Southern Democrat, who wins the popular vote but loses to Rutherford B. Hayes, a Northern Republican, because they get the more electoral votes. All right. So here you see people are, uh, are enraged that somebody won the popular vote but didn't get elected president because the one who won the presidency got the electoral vote. Hmm. How many more times do you think we're going to see this actually in history? All right. This is also a good time to look at why we have the Electoral College. All right. So they come up with a plan because you got to remember, Lincoln was elected with only 39 percent of the popular vote. And what happened right after Lincoln was elected? Ah, remember the South beat feet. 
So Southern Democrats agreed to accept Hayes without opposition if the Northern Federal Troops were evacuated. So those five military districts that are out there, if the Federal Troops would step away, they would accept Hayes as president without opposition. All right. Without the military, there'd be no real way to enforce the reconstruction plans and to protect the rights of the former slaves. All right. Reconstruction ended and African Americans of the South were abandoned by the North. All right. So the South began to enact methods to keep free blacks from voting. This is, you know, the right of the right to uh, suffrage. All right. So once the federal troops were removed, there was nobody to stop them. So the two main ways uh, they could do is through poll taxes and literacy tests. All right, a poll tax is a tax that had to be paid in order to vote, but if you don't have money, you can't play that poll tax. And a literacy test is your ability to read and write. Well, if 95% of the, pop, uh, the black population cannot read or write, they can sit there and say, well, they don't have you know, the ability to vote. These are more of those uh, Jim Crow laws that we we're talking about. So if either of these were not met, the individual could not vote. Well, wouldn't, you're asking yourself, well, wouldn't there be like poor, illiterate white people that couldn't vote? So wasn't this working in both? Well, they developed a thing called the grandfather clause. All right. Grandfather clause was it allowed people who qualified, if your parents or grandparents could vote, then you could vote. So it kind of exists. Well, since the black grandparents and parents could not vote, their kids couldn't vote. It's a way to keep control. Right. Due to the failure of Reconstruction and the Compromise of 1877, segregation and racism through Jim Crow laws dominated the South well into the 20th century. And you're in, you will see these in... I'm sure that you're a little more uh, versed on the history of these because it is a lot more uh, recent in the past 60, 80 years. Right. So as Reconstruction failed, so did the educational opportunities of many black and African Americans. Throughout the 20th century, many protests against the injustice of Jim Crow segregation and racism in the South and would remain in the South after the Civil War until somebody or until people rise up uh, to protest racial discrimination in the 20th century like Dr. King. All right, so that was going to end the, uh, the block for the, or the uh, section for lesson or lecture two, excuse me. It's the end of the day. Give me a break. All right. So I want you to remember 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. 13th Amendment freed the slaves. Emancipation Proclamation didn't free them. The 13th Amendment freed them. Well, in the South, they said, okay, so well, we'll just start denying them their rights because they're not citizens. Well, guess what? So the Congress gets together and says, no, they are citizens. And so then they enact the 14th Amendment. So you, these are American citizens. They are born here or naturalized. They're American citizens. You cannot deny them any basic rights. So they're like, okay, how else can we control? So the South is thinking, 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 and it comes out. They go, so we'll just deny them the right to vote because if they can't vote, then we can pass whatever laws we want to continue to subjugate them. So now Congress hears about this and they're like, all right, you guys didn't understand. With the 13th, they were freed. You guys couldn't figure that one out, so we had to enact the 14th. 14th says they're citizens. It means you can't deny them rights. All right? So, well, you start denying them their rights, so guess what? Now we're going to turn around and make the 15th Amendment. Now you cannot deny the right to vote. All right? Based on, you know, the, the, the established rules. This is important because this is Reconstruction. This is what the, the North was attempting to do was raise up with the Freeman's bureaus and the civil rights acts of the time is to bring everybody up to a basic level playing field. All right, so that'll conclude that. We're going to do a history lab on Friday. 
Um, you'll remember that from a similar one to last week. This will be a whole new set of images. If you have any questions, email me, hit me up on the Google Meet. Until then, I'll catch you later. Have a good one.